and welcome to Goldbridge Saves Football. Well, well, where do we start? Season over for Manchester United, Newcastle and Chelsea. And could it be P45 time for all three of those managers, Ten Hag, Howe and Pochettino? Also the title race. I say Arsenal are now the favourites and I'll explain why. We've also got Prat of the Week. We've got either Oars and I've got another one. Last week it was Haaland. Wouldn't start for Liverpool. We've got another big name that wouldn't start for another big team that you lot can get your teeth into. But I tell you what, I've got someone who's just had his teeth in a big subway, which is not a euphemism. It's Will. How are you, Will? Yeah, lovely subway. Lovely to be here. When you do those intros, sometimes you get a bit ye olde, I think, which yeah. I quite like. We're in a ye olde pub. Hey, uh, hey. Terrible weekend for you. Terrible weekend for me. Birmingham lost. Mention over. Let's get cracking. My cat died. Oh, God. No, yeah. I didn't. United lost. I don't know what's worse, your cat dying or United losing. If you're a cat lover, I think you know the answer. If you're me, I'll take it on a case cat by cat basis. Right, let's get in with the show. Let's get on with the show. Um, you can't complain, it's a hypothetical. That's what have I was. You ever owned a cat? Yeah, I have got a cat. And right he's, now. he's a beast. He's a beast? Oh, beast. Oh, right. Well, he's yeah. a beast then. As Basically, well. when you move house. Yeah. They advise you to keep the cat inside for three weeks because if, if you let them out straight away, they go looking for the old house, oh. which I see as a reason to let them out. Yeah. But anyway, the wife was like, we've got to keep him in. Anyway, the problem was nobody was keeping track of who, who was feeding him. Okay. So he just got really fat. And now he won't do any exercise and uh, he just wants feeding all the time. So he's on double rations. Yeah. And I bet that obviously that mansion that you live in now, obviously, but he doesn't know where he is because he's got all these new rooms to go into and everything like that. He's a bit, he's the cat version of Marcus Rashford, actually. He nice. won't do any running about, but he just wants feeding. Yeah, lovely stuff. Feed me service and I'm not going to do anything for it. But uh, anyway, back to the football. Lots to get into on the show today. Get your comments in as always, and you're going to get some really interesting ones. And interesting either or about Klopp or Pep, which we'll talk about in a bit. But let's start off with, not the title race, we'll come on to that. I do believe Arsenal are favourites, but let's explain that later. Let's start off with season over. Um, horrific weekend for three clubs. My club, Manchester United, um, Newcastle losing at Arsenal and obviously Chelsea embarrassing, humiliating themselves in the Carabao Cup. Um, but you look at the league table, Will, and season over, some would say that's melodramatic if you're saying it in November. We're now saying it in March. Yeah. You look at that league table, all three of them still in the FA Cup, but they can't all win the FA Cup. All three of them really playing for sixth at best, seventh, eighth, which... It's probably Conference League. If that's not the definition of season over, what is? Well, I think we get to March, you get to business time, don't you? And business needs to get done and it's been done, but in a bad way for some, especially for Chelsea yesterday as a recording, like that was a prime opportunity, wasn't it? With all the injuries for Liverpool, they had a really good chance up until the time Virgil van Dijk scored a goal. And I think that's what's the most disappointing thing for Chelsea fans is domestic cups was the only thing that they were going to salvage their season with. Didn't do it. I'd put a bit of pressure on Poch for that. Some of the substitutions were a bit weird at weird times, like Conor Gallagher coming off when he yeah. was probably the most... And also really ironic, I thought yesterday that like Chelsea spent all that money, even Liverpool have spent all that money, and I know come on to the kids and stuff, but like Kelleher was the best player for Liverpool. Liverpool. Uh, Chelsea wise, the keeper was outstanding, Gallagher. So you spend, I know we're going to get onto billion pound bottle jobs, but yeah, I think that's why Poch under pressure. Newcastle, all, all hinged on that FA Cup, doesn't it? But what about United? What hope do you have left? Yeah, I mean, look, on United, I mean, the big conversation after that result, and I felt before it, it was weird. There was a press conference and the, the, the press were disgusting towards Ten Hag. And this was at a point where we'd won our last four games and they're sort of second guessing him, criticising him. I think there is a movement in the media to remove Ten Hag and we, we do see that and I don't care what anybody says the, the the pressure that Eddie Howe gets or even Pochettino gets compared to Ten Hag is ridiculous and what's that all about is it because he's Dutch I don't know is he because he's the newest person in the Premier League I don't know but it has infiltrated the fan base as well we do have this what I mean, it's an interesting point in itself. We still see it at Arsenal with our Teta out movement, which I find incredible. We see it with the Ten Hag movement as well. I just think there's a bit of a change in football in general. And I, I blew my top after the game, uh, during the game, actually, when the Fulham goal went in. I was on my watch along. I was calling people who wanted Ten Hag out scum. Would you like to apologise now? Um, let me finish. I was calling them scum and I was saying that um, you're not real United fans if you're calling for the manager's head after a result like that. You should want them to win. Do I want to apologise? No. I am what I am. I do what I do. 
I say what I say and I've got to stand with it. How many beers did you add at that point? Zero. That was pure emotion at that point. Well, it's it's strange. Like, I I wouldn't, under, especially with Ten Hag and everything that's going on at the club. Like I just feel like you've got to get to the end of the season mm. this year and get that all sorted. So, and also this, we're still at this point where there's no. I mean, we're going to come on to it. Maybe the obvious appointment might be a certain national manager, but until there's that real sort of what manager are we talking about here? Steady on. I don't need to be sick now because I'll have to clean it up. But I think until there's that real sort of cause of like, oh, I don't know, Ancelotti's free or whatever, right? probably need to get rid of him because there's the opportunity there's not that there's no real clear person that would go in at Man United for me no no and it, and it will you know it's a running theme as we talk about Newcastle and Chelsea and get your comments in you don't need to be a Chelsea United or Newcastle fan everyone's going to have an opinion that's what football's all about and I think that when you look at replace I just think it's so simplistic in football these days sell this player you know if I listen to some United fans they're sacking Ten Hag and they're selling Marcus Rashford and Bruno oh how I, let, let's yeah. let's take a wander down lollipop lane look at the candy floss clouds and it's raining lemonade you know, it's mm, it's delicious. just it's just not real talk, is it? It's not realistic. It's as I said at the weekend. There's too much opinion without ac- accountability. People just project opinion and shout it out. Like, like someone at the weekend was saying, United should get Nagelsmann, and I said he's managing Germany in a German Euros till at least the end of June. You, it's impossible. You don't bring a yeah. manager in in July. It's, that would fuck up your whole next season so I think with with the you know there's people who just project these opinions and I think that when you look at United you know remove Ten Hag for who Barcelona need a coach Bayern Munich need a coach Liverpool need a coach at the moment there'll yeah. be other sackings it's, there's not a vast pool of managers Sack, uh, sell Rashford and Bruno to who for how much who are you going to replace them with I'm not saying in the long term that you don't need to do those things but they need. I, I don't know what it is I said, as I said with Arteta it's like that James, I'll give him a shout out. He sent uh, sent us a message in on one of the chats, and um, he said that this this phenomenon that frustrates you, Mark, and maybe will about these fans that you don't understand, who just seem to want to be abusive and vile about players and replace them, etc. It's actually quite common in the NFL. It happened probably in the last decade where fans became fans of players not fans of clubs. Yeah, yeah. They think they support clubs, but actually they're more engaged in players. And maybe that's what's happening with some of the, you know, some of the Premier League fans now is that, you know, they've almost become so locked in on players that they don't necessarily think what's best for the club. But the thing with Man United, the best bit of that, if you were locked in on the players, it's probably the youth ones, isn't it, at the moment? Yeah, yeah. Hoyland, Garnacho, Mano, and they're sort of part of that. Ten Hag, development yeah exactly they're part of that collective where you could actually get really excited as even if you were a fan of the player I mean I can't say this with the amount of stalking I do for Jude and Joe Bellingham but I think they are over 16 yes that's fine yeah clear that up can we just check that now um also yeah I am allowed in a certain radius after the Joe interview which was great clarity for me yeah um but yeah I just think you'd get excited by that and then in in terms of what Man United can do I think the really exciting thing from the Sir Jim interviews was like we are going to set a style of play at the top. So it doesn't matter if you're Ancelotti, Ten Hag, Zidane, you're not coming in unless you agree to this, which is very obvious, but also very good. And I think the more sort of points that Sir Jim and Ineos can do of those, of like setting clear guidelines out of where we've said it before, haven't we? Where next two or three years, we're probably going to be floating in the top half, maybe pushing for a bit of Europe. But at least then that's that's the expectation, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And then you, you you can fall back on that. Whereas if you're saying we might get Champions League football, well, if you don't, you're like, fuck, you know, we're in the shit again. And I do think it's, you know, going back to what we're talking about season over, I think it it's amazing. I was looking at the odds before the Fulham game and United were right in there with Villa and Spurs for yeah. fourth and fifth. And then this morning, it's way out there again because I think that that, that loss is so significant. Villa are now eight points ahead again. If Spurs win their game game in hand, they're six points again. And you look at some games United could win and there is the opportunity to close a six-point gap up on Spurs and Villa. But then you look at the other fixtures and you go, it's not just about closing the gap, it's about going beyond that. And I, I, I think United probably have ruined that at the weekend. And... I think the season is probably... I'll always hold out hope as a United fan, but I think the season probably is over in the sense that the best you're going to get is Europa League. And that's even if you win the FA Cup, which would be nice, but it's going to be the Europa League. And you look at Chelsea, they've sort of choked in the Carabao Cup final. They're not going to get Champions League football. It'd be, they'd have to go some to get Europa League football. And the same for Newcastle. So I think all three clubs, their season is over. 
in relation to what they would want. But then I'm looking at it now. I wouldn't sack any of those managers in the summer. I actually wouldn't. I, I don't think that the manager market's not there for a start. And actually, I think I might have said sack them in the past, but I look at it and go, well, Arteta finished eighth. And then he finished second. Yeah. And it's like, sometimes you're not actually, and this is the thing that chairmen need to realise, sometimes you're not actually that far off when you just sort of write a season off and go, next season, let's do this and this. Well, I, also, I've been chatting to Newcastle fans as well. It's like, we've said it before, Eddie Howe is almost his victim of his own success, isn't he? Because of coming in, saving him from relegation, then getting him to Champions League football. That was definitely in the five-year plan and, and, and he accelerated that. And also, I want as a manager, when I'm a fan of a club, is a manager to sort of project those sort of values and almost be an ambassador of that. And I think you definitely get that with Eddie Howe. I think Ten Hag's had it really, really bad. But if he wins the FA Cup, that's back-to-back seasons of trophy wins for a Man United team that everyone's saying is one of the worst in histories. And Pochettino's in his first year. So give give them time. The proof's in the pudding. Klopp, Pep, like you said, with, with Arteta. And also it'd be, just be a bit more exciting of like, if you're going to go around the merry-go-round again, I mean, you could be looking at who's prime candidate in the summer. Probably yeah. will be Gareth Southgate. Yeah, and I think with um, just because the season's over doesn't mean you have to sack a manager. As I said, with Arteta, he was very eighth twice. Arteta out t-shirts. Look at what they've done. Jurgen Klopp didn't start off that well. I think people are too eager. I mean, I think Burnley have gone the other way, keeping company, in my opinion. But I think people are too eager to get rid of managers when actually things can change around massively in the summer. And look, Newcastle, we've spoken a lot of times about Eddie Howe will probably go in the summer. But as the season's gone on, circumstances change around you. And I look at Newcastle now and I think, well, unless he's going to take the England job, I wouldn't get rid of Eddie Howe because Liverpool are looking for a coach. Barcelona, Bayern Munich. Newcastle are obviously limited by FFP as well. What are they going to do? And Newcastle remind me of my mate Dave. They've overachieved one in one season and they've underachieved. He walked into the, the forest a few few months ago with a supermodel on his arm and wow. everyone, everyone was like, wow, that's overachieved. Mm. That few weeks later, that's over. Walks right. in with someone it looks like he's found in a bin. We were all like, get out. You're not welcome well, She had here. a great personality. I didn't say she was a she. No. Yep, yeah. Sexist. Yeah, sorry. They yeah. had a great personality. No, they didn't. They stunk. Okay. Uh, they got kicked out. Uh, but but the point is, I think that's the thing with Eddie Howe. Massive overachievement, big underachievement. Not getting the... I, I will say this, though, in defence of Ten Hag and the, the, the pressure that Eddie Howe gets put on him and Pochettino gets put on them is, is ridiculously disproportionate. But you look at Newcastle's success, they've had a lot of injuries. Boo-hoo. A lot of teams have. But I think that you know, a, a, a good summer for Newcastle, and conceivably they could go back again next year. I don't think I, I don't I don't think with Newcastle they should change either. No, a good summer for them is almost like keeping Bruno, keeping those style players, and also if you're a Newcastle, uh, if you if you're looking at the next one, right, you want to evolve, and people say like Zidane, mm -hmm. Zidane, this club works because of what Eddie Howe's done with those lesser players, are teaching them up, Zidane probably in the same mould of... No, it's not going to work. It's not going to come in and be like, right, Sean Longstaff, we're taking you to another level. And they have got the budget. Dan Burt, I've played Roberto Carlos, we're getting you to that level. Mm. You know, they've peaked there and with FFP, they can't overhaul the team to be... It's like when Rooney was in charge of Blues, he was like, I need 11 new signings. Mm. Well, guess what, mate? We live in the fucking real world and you can't do that. Leave Rooney out of this. So yeah, and, and then that brings you on to Chelsea, who, look, I know the comment from Neville was something along the lines of the billionaire blue bottle jobs. And, that's, and you know, I actually do agree. I mean, I, I was doing the watch along, 30,000 watching live, you know, pretty, Job. pretty, pretty good that. That's uh, St. Andrews. That's St. Andrews, yeah. On a good day. On a good day. And um, I was saying like, you know, not a Chelsea fan, certainly not a Liverpool fan, but going into extra time, all those kids on the team for Liverpool, all that money and talent on the pitch for Chelsea, this is like when you used to play World Cup and for some reason you've been a bit lazy and you end up in the last round against the shit player and you think, ha kick the ball out, here we go, this is going to be fun. I'll probably do a few keep-ups and bang it in the top corner. The next thing you know, you're sat behind the goal, you're knocked out and he's through and everyone's giving him a hug going, that's amazing. And, and I think that's what happened with Chelsea. It was like just incredibly bad to lose and I'm not taking any way, anything, anything away from Liverpool but that was a bit David and Goliath in extra time I I, I genuinely I know Liverpool were favourites before the game but in extra time Chelsea have got to win that game but well, again yeah also as well it was just 
I think Poch, that, that's where the blame does lie and where you'd be worried going forward. Is does it blame with Poch? Well, I think the just the substitutions will felt quite sporadic at different mm. times, whereas Klopp did those more sort of, I think the two of the lads came on at once and then quickly after. You could just see the energy rising again mm. within that Liverpool team. So that's just a clear thing, even for a simpleton like me to see, where going into extra time, you need fresh legs. You need, I mean, Neil Danson li- literally looked like an absolute man mountain, didn't he? Yeah, he was all yeah. over the place. He was causing problems. Well, they, were, they were knocking on the door before they scored. Yeah, exactly. So I just think that's where he got it wrong. And if you've got that chance and you've got to be so clinical in what you do and he, and he just didn't do it. I think the big thing about Chelsea is that, yeah, obviously they're in that season over category and maybe they can do well in the cup, but there's some there's better teams in the cup than Chelsea. There's better teams in the cup than Newcastle and Man United. So it's going to take something to win it when Liverpool and Man City are in there. But when I watch Chelsea, um, yeah, tactically, I would agree with you. Pochettino's got to go for that. He's got to go for that in extra time to to come out with, which I still find unbelievable that he talks about, you know, we were set up for penalties. You've got to go for that. But then there's only, yeah, I'd give Pochettino some of the blame, but also I'd say, I'm looking at the players. I think Chelsea's problem is a bit similar to Man United. Like it's too simplistic to blame the coach. The players have to take on a responsibility. And if I'm a Chelsea player in extra time, I'm looking at that, that Liverpool team and I'm going, we're winning this. I'm not taking the piss, but we're winning this game because we're better than them. We're more experienced than them. And we're going to... Imp- I mean, look, Man City or Arsenal in that situation do not lose to that Liverpool team. No, no. They, 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 they'd be like, right, we're going to take control of this game now. We're going to step up. We're going to put some pressure on them. And Chelsea invited it. And I think that's a that's a player mentality thing. And that's why I wouldn't change Poch either because I'm like, you see Chelsea fans going get... They're talking about all sorts of people coming back. And I'm like, you're still going to have the same players with the same problem. And also the thing of keeping the manager, but also that obviously leads to keeping the system and keeping the thing. The big thing was, if you're a youngster coming into that Liverpool side, if you're a centre-back or defender, you're learning off Van Dijk. If you're a striker midfielder, you're learning off Mo Salah. There's that clear experience to sort of lean on, set an example, where at Chelsea, there's so much chopping and changing. That's not really there, I don't think, apart from like maybe Thiago Silva, but... I mean, his wife was chirping up on Twitter the other day, so that's probably not the the best example to set, is it? So. No, no, no. I mean, and, and they probably did miss Thiago Silva, to be honest. A bit of experience, maybe. Yeah. Um, it'd be interesting. Look, you know, who do you think get in the comments? Who do you think is going to get sacked first out of those three managers? Because I would set. I mean, if I had to sack one of them, I mean, it's a great question set by me. You can answer it. If you had, to, who who should go out of those three? I mean, I'd say don't sack any of them this summer. I really do think. For all three clubs, it would not surprise me next year if Chelsea, Newcastle and Man United were all fighting for top four, having a completely different season. I think they've all had mitigating circumstances and they all might not be far off. It's just, look at Liverpool last year, look at Liverpool this year, look at Arsenal when they went from eighth to second. This Premier League has shown you that you might you might think you're miles off and actually... There could be fundamentals in place. And obviously I'm biased with United. You've mentioned Ganacho, Hoyland and and, um, Maynou. But there's signs at Newcastle. Miley's come through. They've got some good players when they've got that Joel Linton, Bruno Gamares, midfield three. Chelsea, look, I think you've got to work with Conor Gallagher. Enzo Fernandez looks good. They've got some good players. So it's hard to say. If I had to sack one of them, who would I sack? But I will answer that, but you will answer it first. I think it would be Poch that goes first, not because I'm saying I want him to go, but I think Chelsea fans are not sold on him. They're going to have a bad season this season. And I think if they start off in August, September, not lighting the world on fire, I think he'll definitely go. But then I don't know if we're getting into a stage of like where the FFPP is really going to like, that, that could affect that as well, couldn't yeah. it, with the manager things, especially yeah. if you're potching a um, however many year deal. So I, I think it'll be him just because, and I'm also not sold on him like you, of him being that elite manager that Chelsea expect. Yeah, I think it would have to be Poch. I mean, Eddie Howe sort of suits Newcastle's project. I think Ten Hag has to be given the opportunity to clear out because no Man United manager's ever done it. And I wouldn't get rid of Poch because I think when you look at what he did at Spurs and Southampton, he might be the guy to work quite well in a limited budget. But it's it's also a situation where they've got so much talent at Chelsea, you could almost say, you know, do we do we try something a little bit different? Also, I feel with Eddie Howe in particular, like he's nowhere near the top of his ceiling yet. Like he could get to those Jurgen Klopp. Um, Pep Guardiola levels in the future of like and I, I do think we downplay it because of um, being an English manager a little bit he's so smart he's like the infrastructure at Newcastle 
like he's gone in and made it his own when that could be quite daunting for some. And I really think he could kick on to be maybe with Newcastle or somebody else, but that next big manager. I disagree on that. I don't think he's capable of being a top manager. I think he suits Newcastle for now, but I still think some games I've watched him, Man City this year, Arsenal on Saturday, where I think they they should be doing better than that. I mean, they had no shots at all at half time at the Emirates and against Newcastle, against Man City, I think they should have beat them and he was ridiculously naive to not drop somebody in and just keep them on the 10. Um, but I think he's a good coach. I think he's the right coach for Newcastle for now and he can certainly get them top four, but I don't think he's ever going to be a Premier League winning coach. Uh, uh, maybe that's just the English bias in me there. It certainly is. Peeping it certainly through. is. It certainly is. Um, just before, I want to talk about the title race, but uh, we've had some success with this in the sense of last week I said Haaland doesn't start for Liverpool on Friday. I said Foden doesn't start for Man City, uh, for, for Arsenal. Um, I've got a new one. Oh, God. Here we go. Um, but the, the point of this is just to make it so that we keep the role running and I will stop doing them when it gets to a point where I'm doing them just for views right like there has to be some so you believe this i believe to I, your core yeah if i was to cut you open yeah pull a bit out of you you'd believe this yeah it? if i said like mo salah's overrated i don't believe it i'm just doing it to get some clicks and views a lot of people do this on youtube so this is this isn't my next one let's see how it goes bruno fernandez doesn't start for Spurs. Some would say Man United. Bruno Fernandes does not start for Spurs. And the reason for that is you'd expect someone like Bruno Fernandes to start for Spurs, but I don't put him in because his position, the way Spurs play, because they've got Bissouma and Saar, he can't play that position. I'm not picking him ahead of Son or Kulusevski or their striker. So he plays in the James Madison position. And is Bruno Fernandes a better player than James Madison? Yes. Is Bruno Fernandes a better player? player in a Spurs system than James Madison. No, you could argue that James Madison would be better for Man United than Bruno at the moment, but it's not just about form. It's about the type of player. Bruno is absolutely brilliant when he's on it, but inconsistency has obviously caused him problems this year. But what Bruno Fernandes is as a number 10 is he's a Hollywood passer. He's a Hail Mary passer. He goes for the ridiculously difficult pass. You know, you're in possession. There's an easier pass. And he'll play a 40-yard ball trying to get Rashford in or somebody like that. Whereas a James Madison or an Odegaard or someone like that, they can hit those passes, but more often they're instructed and will follow um, instruction to play a more simpler possession rotation ball. You know, And I think that is why a, a number 10 like Bruno Fernandes and also discipline. Bruno will end up on right back, left wing. Madison... Odegaard, they'll stay in the areas so that when the midfielder gets the ball, they know where they are. Whereas I think if you're Casemiro and you're looking for Bruno, he might be behind you. You know, it's, a, it's almost a pantomime at Old Trafford. He's behind you. So I think that that's my stance on this one. And actually, it's, I think it's quite a strong one. I think you are spot on on this one, actually. <gasps> I was nearly going to knock your block off when you started speaking, but that's just when I look at you. I think the way, it's funny, isn't it? Because Big Ange has probably got more of a style and system for the neutral to see than what Eric Ten Hag is. And I don't think the way I see Bruno Fernandes would definitely not fit into that. I think as a captain for Manchester United, absolutely awful. Like, I just, <laughs> I think as a leader, and there's obviously those traditional values that you can probably see on Jay Humphrey's high performance. You've got to be really careful here. It's like walking through my living room with shit on your shoe. Yeah, go on. Uh, we might be friends, but I'm still very, you know, you're walking on my, not my grave, I'm but on my your carpet. Patch. I'm on your cabbage I patch. do like Bruno Fernandes. I'm not saying you don't. I've chosen this one is because I, I wanted to show that these things that I'm saying are actually based on tactics and the way other teams play. You yeah. can't just drop Mbappe into, well, you probably no, no. can, but yeah. you know what I mean? Well, you could put in Har Harland straight into Liverpool, for instance, like that. You can't. You can. Um, but with Bruno Fernandes, I just, yeah, I don't think he would fit that big Ange style tactically. And there's also a bit of me would just think he'd be a bit disruptive. I just don't, I just don't feel I really don't like Bruno Fernandez on the pitch. I'm sure he's a lovely bloke to go for a pint of ale down the forest with, but I I, I do agree with you. He'd walk in with the supermodel. Yeah, and probably some shit on his shoe as well. Um, I just think it, it wouldn't work. And Madison, I just hope Madison has a really good push on for the next three months because he could really start 
push a claim for that midfield three with England as well. No, I do like Bruno Fernandes and I did want to just come up with one on this show that would get everybody but you think do believe it. That, every, that everyone would... Yeah, I do believe it because I'm throwing a Man United player under the bus. Um, in, in, and, but this is... This, I'm going to keep this going until I, I, I really drop the ball with one that's absolutely a stinker. But um, no, I think that... I've been saying it about Bruno for a long time. Absolute, when he's on it, he's brilliant and he's always at the top of the stats for chances created, etc. But you look at... Yeah, that Fulham game left me scarred, but it's been happening all season. And I do longingly look at people like Madison and Foden and De Bruyne and Odegaard who play in the similar position and they can hit those passes, but they're not trying to do it 30 times a game. Yeah. They will keep the ball. And in the modern game, possession is so important. And Bruno's just not a possession-based player. He doesn't want to slow it down and go you know, let's let's keep the ball. He wants to get it and look and go, oh, or it, sometimes he doesn't even look. He just hits a ball and go, oh, they're not there, you know. Well, I, I know where the tipping point will be for me is when you walk in and you go, Jude Bellingham would not start for X team because I'd bring this set faster than anything down. I'm going to find, Friday, I'm going to find a, I'm going to find a team that Jude Bellingham doesn't start for. Well, just thinking we've got... But it doesn't have to be now. I could say Jude Bellingham would not start for... Barcelona 2011. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, if there actually, you get a niche. Yeah, yeah I'm going to get niche. Yeah, don't get I'm going to get niche. Don't ruin our relationship. It's um, let's awesome. let, let's move to the title. Um, and from one hot take to another, um, I'm doing this as of now. I think Arsenal are title favourites. I disagree. I still think it's Liverpool. And after yesterday, with that like demonstration of squad depth and ac- academy depth, and just the wave, the feeling, the momentum. Injuries I, though. Yeah, I know. But I spoke about it before going into. The, the Carabao Cup final, like you, you're sort of selling the narrative of Jurgen Klopp and he's buying into it. The fans are buying into it. And that probably was 5% of them getting over the line yesterday. Injuries, awful. Like Gravenberch going down yesterday. Trent with the knees. Salah, a bit, a bit doubtful as well. So I, I do get that. I don't think Nunez is very far off when you look at how he Bloody celebrates hell. that goal. He was fucking pulver. What's wrong with that him? one? Yeah, he was absolutely What's he fantastic. With Has he got piles or something? Because like, what, what is the injury? Because, you know, maybe his cat died. Have you ever had piles? Well, I don't. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Is it painful? No. Nah. Would you be able to move like that? Yeah. Fine. Okay. Just clearing that up. A bit of medical advice. But no, yeah. I, yeah, for me, it's Liverpool. I'm sticking with it. I don't want to be a, a switcher like that, like you moving about all over the place. But, but but that's the whole point. I mean, I don't think having a different favourite each week in a three way title race. Each week's a bit much. No, no, I, I, because I don't think Arsenal will win it. But I think right here, I think you can say favourites right now is that. But I don't think Arsenal will win it. Uh, you know, and if they're not going to win it, then is it not fair to say that at this moment in time, they look like favourites? It doesn't mean they're going to win it in May because there's going to be lots of twists and turns. I think that's the great thing about this title race is that we could all be boring and go, City are favourites because they've won it three times in a row and they'll get the job done. But, you know, I think that result against Newcastle was incredible. I think their form since New Year has been incredible. And I think that they look... I just want to give them some credit because they actually look like a title winning team to me at the moment. Why I don't think they'll win it though is because right here, right now, if they played Liverpool or or Man City, I think they'd beat them. Right. I do. I do. Oh, Man City or Liverpool would beat Arsenal? No, I think Arsenal beat both of those teams at the moment. Right. I think Arsenal are, in, are the informed team. So why don't you think they'll win it? Because I just don't think they're going to get... If they, can play the, if they can play at the Etihad in early April with the team they've got at the moment, I think they've got a great chance, but you know what's going to happen. Yeah. Look at this season. It's going to be Saliba or Rice or Saka, or maybe two of them. They're going to pick up an injury for two or three months. And if that happens to Arsenal, it's game over. It's done. I've played the game and, and they're gone. They're gone. They cannot afford an injury and probably Odegaard as well. You know, they can't the, afford that. The exciting thing was they had a problem. They weren't scoring enough goals. They've solved it and they've not bought a recognised striker in. Mm, like Kai that's... Havertz had a load of chances yesterday. That I mean, they should have had about five or six against Newcastle in in that game. So I I think that's one thing. Jorginho to... was magnificent in yeah, that game. I, I, they they had so many chances and like for to have um, Jesus and Nketiah on the bench. Like I think that's fantastic. The one I worry about is this Champions League sort of overhanging them. Like mm. they have got a good chance to have a really good run. They're one 0 down against Porto. You want to stay in it. You want to win it. But we've seen what Arsenal can do with like a clear schedule, a clear bit of rest. They really get the momentum rolling. So it's going to be an interesting one. That FA Cup game against Liverpool was a godsend. 
you know, what, they're, losing they're, it. yeah, they're not playing midweek. I think they don't play until next Monday. So that's an eight day rest again. Yeah. Um, it's been an absolute godsend for them. Um, I want to shout out the Martinelli goal, actually. The ball from Jorginho into Havertz cuts it back. Undefendable. Brilliant. And uh, nice to see Jorginho back because I always liked him at Chelsea. I think he was sort of had the piss taken out of him for a couple of years. But I always thought he was a really... Well, him sort and of, Rice are great as well. Sort of like, yeah, and I, I like that dynamic of having two more defensive conductor type players. And I think that having that option for Arsenal is good. But I just, I hope they don't get any injuries because obviously I'd rather Arsenal win the league over Liverpool because they're our biggest rival and Man City because don't like them. Um, I'd but, love Jurgen Klopp. Just imagine the scenes at Anfield. No, I don't want to imagine the oh, scenes. Imagine oh, imagine yeah, them, Mark. imagine it. Close your eyes. It's like imagining someone having a go on a bloody... Yeah, I'm not even going to say the words. Your cat. No, oh, that's, disc- that's That's criminal. That's criminal. <laughs> that's actually criminal. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think Arsenal would be. Um, yeah, I don't know how your brain works. I think <laughs> Arsenal. I think Arsenal at the moment are favourites, but it will change week to week, and um, I think a lot depends on how badly these injuries impact Liverpool. How quickly He's they mad. can get him back. Um, Man City. I don't like to wish. I don't, I'm not wishing injury on anyone, but Man City could do with a few injuries just to make it a little bit fairer. Edison to lose an arm. <laughs> Something like that. Rodri to run over his foot yeah. uh, in Tesco's and break two toes. I yeah. just, and even like the, the Bournemouth game. The, but I t- t- Bournemouth, very, very good against Manchester City. Had so many chances. Like, But then that t- ties into that thing that we don't want to speak about of like Man City getting a 1-0 win when they didn't probably deserve all three points. And uh, there's a great point about Man City as well. We sit and acknowledge the fact that when Man City don't have Rodri, they do lose games. Yeah, And yet, it's not an excuse if Liverpool have got injuries. Yeah. It's not an excuse if Newcastle have got injuries. It's not an excuse if Man United have got fucking Lindelof at left back and, you know, Casemiro goes off at half time and no Hoyland. I think I think managers, some fans actually take managers as gospel. You'll hear Eddie Howe or Ten Hag say we can't use and Klopp, you can't we can't use injuries as an excuse. They're only saying that because they don't want their players to hear them using injuries as an excuse. In reality, behind the off the camera, they're going, I can't believe how many injuries we've got. Of course, it's a bloody excuse. You take Rodri out of a, the best team in the world and they lose games. Liverpool are losing eight or nine players. If, if, Mar- if Arsenal lose Declan Rice, they're probably not in a t- title race as well. So injuries are massive. And, and, and those teams that have been impacted by them this year, you know, it is a bis- bigger disadvantage. And I think it is something to bear in mind with Liverpool. The one thing I'm I'm excited for from a Manchester City losing the title perspective is that I really don't think they replaced that experience. Like Calvin Phillips was never going to be the replacement for Rodri. Ilkay Gundogan's that sort of player that comes into the last 10 games of the season and kicks on. There's other areas where they've not improved. And I think that's what's cost them in those defeats, not just with Rodri, but those other ones. And that's what I'm holding out hope for, to give everyone hope at home that we can have a three-horse race down to the last day. Yeah, I'm sure we'll have a different favourite next week. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Villa. Uh, it's not a section. I just want to give Villa a shout out. You'll hate this. Piss, yeah. No, because obviously they they lost a couple of games in the league. They got knocked out of the cup with Chelsea. Newcastle, Man United beat them at Villa Park and everyone was like, the wheels are going off. They've been to Fulham and won and they blasted Forest at the weekend and they've got themselves firmly back in a situation. And also bad injury again to Kamara, which is obviously going to be impactive. But you look at that midfield four now of McGinn and Luis and Jacob Ramsey's come in and Tillemans. Bailey, Watkins, Torres comes back, injury, they play differently now. So I think Villa have got a great, it'd be stupid not to mention it. They are, they are hot favourites for Champions League football, which is incredible. Oh. That I was mean, Emery. How long have you been doing this He's like, for? cheers, mate. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm be- I bet he is giving you a bloody ring. Well done, mate, for beating Fulham and Nottingham Forest. We're doing, a, we're doing a segment on the podcast because they've beaten Fulham and Nottingham Forest. We're doing a segment on the podcast because they're hot favourites. They're the favourites for fourth place. Well, I don't... Incredible. I, I disagree with that. And also... Not getting cut. Yeah, well, I don't care. Well, it's in. your podcast, but I just think that's... Our a- podcast. Our podcast. We had Loz on last week when it was the kickoff. Eam and Brian did it together, yeah. but they decided to call it the True Geordie podcast. And now they don't speak together. Well, th- these things happen, but it's still our podcast. Yes, it's our podcast, and that's absolutely outrageous. To give a shout out for beating Fulham and Nottingham Forest, you either... You're going to get so much stick in the comments, and I welcome them. Get in there, UTV. Right, uh, you're taking the pit. I don't mind the blues either, but I'm just saying. No, you, I know. You've I, got I, to give them credit. No, I do think you've got to give them credit, but I think 
Also, I don't know if Emery's come out and dismissed those Bayern Munich rumours. That's the biggest thing. Stop. He's trying to stir you up, Villa fans. Don't have it. Anyone hear that? About, it'd be quite good if Villa's Emery... biggest problem is Gabby Ogbonglahor's there, a big mouthpiece, and nobody wants that. Let's yeah. move on. Yeah, you've got... Uh, well, I mean, that's like where... I mean, Mike is very good now, but like Man City struggle, don't they, with like Paul Dickoff and Sean Goat, yeah. they're your big yeah. big media types. Yeah, Villa... Villa yeah, come on. Yeah, somebody's got to do something for that. that. But no, I thought they did uh, deserve a shout-out. Um, actually, talking about Pratt, should we move on to Pratt of the Week? Yeah, fantastic. Lots of nominations this week. Um, do you want to start with... Um, there's a few that we've sort of spoke about because of the Cup Final. A lot of shouts for like Ted Bowley because... I mean, the criticism is fair. A bit awkward between him and Potch as well. Um, Bruno, I was going to put down as Pratt, but we've mentioned him as well. Um, Alan Brazil, we've got down here. You were on Talk Sport the other week. Oh, yeah. I mean, you do a podcast on a Monday. You say Erling Haaland shouldn't start for Liverpool. Wednesday morning, you're on Talk Sport. You and your best mate, Gabby. But I just thought Alan Brazil, if he was in the Perlo role there, dictating as a presenter, he just got it all wrong, sort of like a very fuddy duddy. I mean, he's probably pissed, but like, just got it completely wrong from the start. <laughs> That's an accusation. Um, look, you know what? I said that on the podcast, and it obviously got a lot of interaction on Twitter. Which but... I, 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 sorry, I, I think you're an idiot for saying that. No, but I, I, I justified it. But what I'm saying is the way Alan Brazil sort of like led into the conversation of like it was like. It was like a guy goading two guys to have a fight in the schoolyard. Like, Well, Talk Sport asked me to go on, which I'm, I'm always happy to do, because normally they want me to talk about Man United, and obviously I talk about a lot of other things. So I was like, oh, yeah, we're not talking about Man United, are we? No, we want to talk to you about the liverpool Harlem thing. So I was like, great. Yes, what time? Half seven tomorrow morning. Great. And then they said, it's Alan and Gabby. And I went... Warning, warning. I knew what was happening. It's like... Gabby's probably protect some producer or somebody said, get him on. This is your chance to absolutely bury him. It's a bad take. So I knew it was coming. And then when I went on, it was sort of like, how many names have you got? Oh, well, two. Yeah. And they were like silenced because I was, I think they thought I was going to go one. No, you've got, you know, and then they were like, well, what is it? Gabby, tell him what it is. And I'm like, I felt like going, you know, this is like five years old, yeah. but obviously they're not in this world. And then I just like said, let's move on. And then, then they, they, we had the chat. And then they just kept going on and on about, well, if Haaland wins the title, would you put him in the Liverpool team? That's not my point. Yeah. And I told them the stats, as I told you the other day. And then it was like, huh, there was a talk sport five-a-side thing where Alan didn't pick you. <laughs> yeah, still not putting Haaland in the team. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. You've got to call me a Forest fan? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So yeah, I, but the funny thing about that is I didn't really care. The producer messaged me and I was like, oh, good show. I think you, you know, did quite well. And then loads of people over the last few days have sort of gone, it was like it was like playground bullies and stuff like that, and I was just like, mm, I don't know whether it was. I don't think it was that. I just thought it was like, you know, it's not like. I, I just I don't really get what the point was. Let's talk about the football. Yeah. Well, I call you Mark, and people are always like that's a bit weird, but it's like I've always I've only known you as Mark, and you've said it as well. Like when people come up to you and call you Brent, it's like them trying to be like, oh, I actually know your real name. Like, do you want yeah. to be friends? So yeah. I, I, I think some people think it's a really powerful thing, and yeah, I just yeah. sort of like go, all right, oh, Brent. Right. Yeah. You know, I always you, think, though, your actual name's really cool. Yeah. Thanks, mate. No, it's all right. But, but look, look, you know, it's like <laughs> when you see when I see KSI at the Sidemen, yeah. I don't even know what his real name is. Yeah. The, the Bazinga. Mini Minter. Elton John, Mini Road Minter. Simon's Mini Minter, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Harry's Road to Shore. Yeah. But I, I wouldn't go, Harry. Yeah, yeah. Simon! Yeah. I'm, I'm, I need an alias. Yeah. But loads of people do it. I don't, I don't, I just, my nickname's the Weasel. Should I, I just think that? you know? Okay. Let's have a dear bit about football. That's yeah. what we're here to do. Um, yeah, but they're they're setting you up for like gotcha, aren't they? Yeah, waiting for the article. You won't believe Mark Goldbridge's real name. Well, you will because five years ago he went on the kickoff yeah. and there was a massive video about it, and yeah. everyone knows. Or you can go on any website and find out. Yeah, I I thought it was a, I did, it was what if the docs back, but I think that you know. I don't know what I don't know what the angle was there, but it's not the first time it's happened on there, is it? Hey, it's all right. You're safe. Yeah. I'm all right. You're right. You lot protect me. That's what it's all about. Um, another one. I don't know who the outright Pratt would be, whether it be the FA, whether they are Pratt. Mm. What do you think at home? But there was a news last week that we didn't cover just because we had so much on. But the FA. Well, it's relevant because the FA Cup's this week. That's why we put it in the running order. Well, um, the TNT people are taking over the FA Cup. There's going to be no more free-to-air FA Cup action. A competition that was sort of maybe already on the rocks a little bit and it has peaks and flashes, but is going behind that pay barrier. Uh, will it be the death of the FA Cup? 
I'm surprised TNT have done it. I mean, they could have just bought that's football and you know, b- you know, boosted their views and done something like that. I mean, surely that's football's got more value views wise than FA Cup because I just don't think the FA Cup is a valuable thing to take behind a paywall. I think I I, I question the people behind this deal and who's making money off it because. Of course, the FA will say, well, it's money that's going into the sport and it's going to help grassroots football. And I get that. But money's not the be all and end all. Exposure is. And the FA Cup this year has not been particularly bad. I think there's been some, you know, Maidstone. Obviously, Arsenal played Liverpool one weekend. Um, It's not been too bad in relation to... And we've got games this week that are on, I think, Wednesday night. There's ITV1 and BBC have got games at the same time. And I think that's, that's, that's absolutely brilliant. I don't think everything should be behind a paywall. Like Wimbledon should be on BBC, um, you know, the Olympics. I mean, I think it's a well, shame. Even like the Ashes, when that's not on the... Yeah, on, that the should Six be on Nations should, yeah. be, should be on it. And now the FA Cup has been taken off. So on principle, I think some things should be kept on free to air, definitely. Um, but also, I think that you make a good point about the damage it does, because I know when Champions League football used to be on ITV... When it went behind a paywall, I know people who don't watch the Champions League because they're like, I'm yeah. not I'm not paying for it. So I can and the Champions League is the elite sport. So if people are doing that for the Champions League, I don't think people are gonna go and pay. I mean, they'll have TNT anyway, because they've got Premier League and Champions League, and they may watch the FA Cup, but it's not gonna make I don't think it helps attendances for the FA Cup or viewing figures at all. Well, it's just that when something's on free-to-air telly, it's just that more inquisitiveness. Like yeah. when I think Villa Chelsea was on, on ITV the other week and I'm, I might f- flick on and watch it on TNT normally or wh- if it was on Sky because it was on ITV. There's just something, I don't know if it's we're that generation, but there's an awe of it, like Champions well, League. This is an example and I wonder if you or anyone else has done this. You know, like at Christmas time and it might be the Sunday two weeks before Christmas and Elf's on Channel 4 at 7 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got it on Amazon Prime but because it's on Channel 4, now I'm you like, can watch it Elf's, on! Yeah. Elf's on! <laughs> Elf's on! Everybody! Elf's on! <laughs> it's starting! Yeah. It's starting now! And it's like, yeah, I, I do. And there's 10 breaks but, yeah, but it's on terrestrial. Put the t- we'll have a tea every yeah, break. Yeah. Yeah, and also I think that, like the EFL and the Championship suffer from that because like you think as a football fan, I put you in this category, right? You, you're not you're not interested in Birmingham City being on, for example. But say that they were on ITV, which it used to be back on in the day at like twelve o'clock, and you're flicking through, you might leave that on, and then mm. all of a sudden it just starts this one day. I think the most damaging thing was is for the lower teams, so, like Maidstone this year. They were on BBC One twelve thirty uh, for for their game against Ipswich. If that's on TNT, nah, it's yeah. just it's just ruining that those mar- those narratives, those stories, and people are just going to tune tune off. Let us know in the comments what you think about this because you might not even care, and I think that's the point. Like you're gonna ca- you're gonna care even less now. And yeah, I'm sure the FA and TNT and everybody else they'll say there's a lot more money being made, but money doesn't mean anything if your audience is going to drop. Yeah. Like if we. If you know, I remember again, we were talking about this, weren't we? Like, there was a YouTube footballing channel that went to Twitch and they got paid good money for it, but their audience didn't grow. Yeah, yeah. and then once that money runs out, you've got to go back and you've lost your audience. And I think that, I mean, hopefully, the FA Cup will come back, but I'm very surprised, very surprised by that. Yeah, no, it's disappointing. So, we, we've had a few suggestions up top, we've had those ones that we just discussed there. Who would you go for? Um, I'm inclined to go with Poch because I just think that that was Chelsea's moment and it was going to be a difficult final anyway. And I felt that, I think I said in the, on Friday, I think they'll win it. But going into extra time against that type of a Liverpool side and not going for it, I can't think of anything that supersedes that as Pratt of the Week. It's just such a massive opportunity. And it was, Gary Neville was right, it was a bottle job. I agree because... Me as a mere mortal, when I'm identifying tactical errors and substitution errors in Poch's game... You're in trouble. You're in trouble. You're in big, big trouble. So Poch is proud proud of the week. week. Right, should we do some quick either-ors before we go on to the quiz? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got some big ones. Um, Let's start with the current one because it's been debated about because of another success for Jurgen Klopp. Klopp or Pep? But can I caveat this with maybe a different direction? Go. Could... Klopp do what Pep's done and could Pep do what Klopp's done because I don't think Pep Guardiola at Liverpool works because as well as 
understanding and setting the precedent with everything with the Gagan pressing and everything Jurgen Klopp's done at Liverpool he is the perfect ambassador for that club like he is the perfect he gets the fans he gets everything and I don't see just because of Pop Pep's legacy at Barca Bayern Man City those are all sort of three clear things I think Jurgen Klopp could do well at Man City I don't think Pep could do well at Liverpool I've got to be careful not to call them Pop and Clep which is what I normally yeah, mix nice. them up as um, but I think that it might be outrageous to say this because it's purely speculative, which is a bit like the Van Dyke goal that was ruled out in the Carabao Cup final where they decided to predict that Colwell would get on the end of a cross that I don't Mate, think he was. In the stadium, it says uh, VAR looking at offside. Yeah. So I'm like, right. But then you see Michael Oliver walking over to the monitor. But there's no, you know, like in the NFL, it's like yeah. to camera telling you what's going on. I was fucking clear. You, you're on your phone. Yeah. It's, you're no understanding. It's terrible. And also the offside looked like it was done on your phone. Yeah. The, the angle of that oh was just God. incredible. But um, I think that to say something outrageous and totally predictive, I really don't think Pep's personality would work well with, with Liverpool at all. I think he's a subtle, egotistical, arrogant man, which he's got every right to be. Um, you see it in his interviews, etc. I don't think that would come across and work very well with Liverpool. I think with Liverpool, you've al- you've always got to be in awe of the club, of the fans, yeah, true, and what it's yeah, all yeah. about. And Klopp does that fantastically well. It's always Liverpool. It's us as uh, well, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and us. And whereas I don't think that's how Pep works. I don't think it's his personality. So I think that's a good point. Um, but I've always been Klopp over Pep. I think that um, Pep is all... I said this at the weekend, and it's so funny how people take things that you didn't, don't say. Because I said, I would love to have seen Pep Guardiola manage an Arsenal where there's work to do and there's not an open checkbook. And I said it's similar to how I would love to have seen Messi play in the Premier League. He's still arguably the best player that's ever played the game, but I would love to have seen him in the Premier League. To which people said... Messi hater. He'd have scored loads of goals in the Premier League. I said, no, I'm literally saying I'd like to see him play in the Premier League. I don't say, I'm not saying he's a bad player. So I'd love to, I'm not taking anything away from Pep, fantastic manager, but I'd like to have seen him do something that's a little bit more of a challenge than make Barcelona one of the best teams in the world, you know, and and Man City. But let's be honest, he's done an amazing job, but there were things there to support him. Whereas I think Klopp taking on a Liverpool team like that and turning it into what he has... And I, I do think that the Carabao Cup final will go down as one of his big things to win with kids like that. It's just, it will go down as a legacy win. So I think that, and also I prefer Klopp's style of football. I prefer his personality. And this is a Man United fan saying this. So I would say for me, Klopp is better. Although obviously I understand people are going to go, look at the football, look at what he's won. Pep's better. Yeah, well, I agree. Um, let's stay with Manchester City. One, I don't know if you saw it at the weekend, but uh, Sergio Aguero had some good news that he might be able to start playing football again. Might be able to. Thirty six, any thirty five now? Yeah, we're just nice story anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah, give him his chance. He's only shit on his no, chest. that's what I mean. He could still come back. Oh, why'd you hate him? I was thinking about that. Saudi, definitely. Oh god, he's yeah. in the money. Yeah, he'll be yeah. straight he's... over there. Yeah, yeah. Um, when they finish their career, who will be your best striker, Sergio Aguero or Erling Haaland? Oh, I mean, that's uh, highly predictive as well. I mean, look, I, I really did like Sergio Aguero as a, as a player. I mean, scored the worst goal I've ever witnessed, you know, that one against QPR. Um, but I think Erling Haaland, yeah. Just I think, the uh, yeah, just pure goal scoring ability. And he's still so young. And what he's won. And the pathway he went on. And the fact that everyone said he was going to be world class at such a young age and he's delivered that. Um yeah, I, I, it has to be Haaland. One uh, one I needed to finish the show on with because it could end up in an all-out brawl, which is quite appropriate for a pub setting if you're watching. We're not finishing the pub show now, are we? No, no. Oh. Well, well, we're going into the final stage. Oh, okay. So just the... Extra time. Chelsea fans, be careful. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey. Yeah, the substitution. Give up. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the bus. Um, is there was actual reports, so this isn't me making them up, fantasising about them, with the news that Dan Ashworth is going to Manchester United, mm-hmm. that his favourite, if Ten Hag was to go, would actually be Gareth Southgate as Manchester United manager. Where are these reports coming from? Because they sound like they're Seen coming from your mate Twitter? down there. That's football Twitter. Yeah, no, no, there were actual reports. I can't remember which journalist did it. But that Dan Ashworth, like Southgate, is his man. Um, obviously, fantastic pedigree, which I think we can all agree. Um, his time as Middlesbrough, then England Relegated. 21 manager then uh, England manager with the best period in our living lifetime. So would you want Ten Hag or Gareth Southgate as your manager going forward? 
It's like saying, do you want to win the lottery and live your life happily for the next 60 years or do you want to just walk in front of that bus? But I don't, and do Southgate's th- the bus. Do you not think Southgate would be a lot more pragmatic than Eric Ten Hag? There's a, s- and there's a clear style there from Gareth Southgate and, you know, a, a real good achievement to working with youngsters and really changing the culture, which is sort of like what you're trying to do at Ineos a little bit, isn't it? Uh, this might be a reason for Ineos to do it. And if it is, fair play. But I've always said if they bring Gareth Southgate and his Manchester United manager, I'm out. It's that's football full time and United stand is going to be taken over by somebody else. I will not watch and commentate and give opinion on Gareth Southgate as Man United manager. It's not that bad. That would be the bottom of the barrel. No, that would be... I I detest him as a coach. Why? I don't like him as a manager. He's favourites. Like, He's done something Nepotistic, negative. Did he tie you to that tree? Look, Southgate would not get a, a job with anybody else in the Premier League bar probably Crystal Palace because he played for them. He's not that level of a coach. And if Man United thought Southgate was the guy, I'd literally think of about another 250 managers I'd go before before him. Right, that's next video. Yeah. The 250 <laughs> managers that I'd rather have than Southgate. No. Well, I can't wait for the appointment. And if Dan Ashworth's listening, I think get it done quick. Get it locked in as soon yeah. as you can. That's the end of the United Stand as well. Yeah, You've well, got it here on, on a podcast first. There you go, yeah. Imagine people... if I stopped doing the United Stand and then Southgate went and won. Well, that's what you're going. you got <laughs> a back dynasty, to the club. A dynasty of Premier League titles. And he can do that. It's, it's I'd, a... I'd have to quit the United Stand. I'd have done it premature. Uh, I'd, I'd been right to quit it. I'd seen it coming. Yeah. The success. It was never going to get any better than that. Um, yeah. Right, do you want to finish on Guess Who? Yeah, let's finish on Guess Who. Uh, as of last week, it's still 8-3. Another draw oh, after some fantastic uh, back and forth. That's um, absolute domination, isn't it? Yeah, you are the leader. Would you uh, like to start? I'll go first, yeah. Okay. Go on then. Okay, I am um, a retired former... Um, referee. No, no. no. David, I, I don't know what I'm thinking of here. David Ellery. I'm a, ref, I'm a retired former England player who had 57 caps and scored two goals. Steve McManaman. Good guess. That no. is a good guess. Oh, really? <laughs> it's not right. Uh, clue two. I started my career at uh, Crystal Palace and I finished my career at Middlesbrough. Gareth Southgate. Yeah! yeah! <laughs> I actually thought I thought you might get that first time. Because, oh, uh, brilliant. Because we were just talking about him, but I had, pick, I had pre-picked that. Okay, nice. Yeah, you weren't writing anything down. Right, mine starts it with... It is 8-3. I sort of need to... You know, it, it, it'll come up with like George Weah's brother or something like that on this one. It was his cousin. Um, number one, I have scored in the final of the Carabao Cup. Um, well, the EFL Club, because I'll give you a clue, it wasn't called that. Um, I, I know who I want to go with and go I on. can't remember his name. Go, I'll, I'll help you out. Obafemi Martins. Has he got it? <laughs> Ooh, first guess. You should have just said, no, it's not, and then quickly got on your phone. Oh, oh you just so I can read you like a book and not a very good book. <laughs> you, know, you know, spot the dog. I don't believe that. Spot the guess who. You're doing something. As soon as you said EFL Cup winner, I thought, oh, it's going to be something left field. Therefore, it's got to be Birmingham City. Maybe I am. Maybe I've got. A, I think I've got to go home, look in the mirror and have a long so that's chat nine with three. Yeah. It's going to get to a point where you can't even win this back. Well, who's used to say, what about if it never ends? What about if it never ends? It would just be humiliation every week. I mean, come on, you've got to give me my flowers there, everyone in the chat. That was that the first first timer? First first timer, probably, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. And you got it on clue two as well. I know, yeah. Just when I think, it's like at the weekend, Goldbridge, we both picked Crystal Palace players, very niche. Jordan I scored, I was like, absolutely brilliant. And then Matessa, which you'd picked, scored a penalty. I couldn't fucking believe it. Well, a little bit of a look ahead to Friday as well. Goldbridge's first defender scorer of the season, Dunk. Well, I, yeah. And then Will had Gabrielle starts messaging me and, of course, got chalked out as an OG, which it was, to be fair. Well, I think we need to get it on the screen, get the lines and the circles out because I it swear wasn't that in. ball. Yeah. No, come on. No. We're it, being silly. It's definitely not. Um, fantastic show. Uh, make sure you give us a follow, smash a like, and get in the comments. Uh, we're alive. Uh, no, we're not live. We're back. We are alive. Uh, we're back on Friday, of course, Tuesday, Friday, Goldbridge Saves Football Podcast. Fantastic. Lots for you to get involved in, as usual. Thanks for your support. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Mark. Catch you later.